Well, we're going to go ahead and get started, and uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get into our topic. Gracious Lord God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and for everyone who's here. Uh, I do pray, Lord, for those who could not make it or had to leave early. And just pray, Father, that you will open our eyes tonight, that you will teach us, that you will use my stumbling words to honor you and to uh, uh, minister to everyone who's here. Uh, make things clear that are unclear, and may you be glorified. Uh, we also pray, Lord, for the team in Israel, that you would help them, encourage them, protect them, give them many, many, many other witnessing opportunities to share Christ. So we thank you, we praise you, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So again, welcome to our Open Bible Studio electives. For those who are here for the first time, again, a double welcome. Glad you guys could make it this time. Well, we are in our topic called, What is the Kingdom of God? Looking at part two tonight, we will be looking at the Kingdom of God in the New Testament. Now, we will do a little bit of a review, and this is a very important topic, very important topic. So let's start reviewing now. Uh, last time we studied kingdoms in the Old Testament, regular kingdoms, you know, Babylon, Egypt, you know, kingdoms. Uh, we also looked at some prophecies about the kingdom for Israel, the kingdom for Israel. Uh, we looked at different passages, uh, also about Messiah who was going to come and rule on earth with, of course, uh, the faithful Jews, the saints. But we also saw two kingdom concepts, we could say. The first one is God's eternal kingdom. That is, God rules and reigns over everything. He raises up kings, He takes them down. You know, read the book of Isaiah, read the book of Daniel. That kind of talks about His eternal kingdom. He is the ruler. He is all in all. But there's also a specific theocratic kingdom that God promised to Israel. This is where Jesus the Messiah would rule and reign from Jerusalem. So we have His eternal authority over heaven and earth, but then there's a specific rulership that God promised to them. And we looked at that a little bit last time. And it's the second one that causes division and problems and confusion a lot of times. Now we won't be answering every question in this series, so please don't think that we will because there's no way to do that. But one thing we do need to keep in mind is the Davidic covenant. We talked about that last time. I just want to go over that real quick here. It's in 2 Samuel 7, 10 through 16. And the Lord said this, Moreover, the Lord declares to you, David, that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom, physical kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Of course, that's Solomon's temple. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love, chesed, faithful love, will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom, remember he's talking to David here, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, all these different words, kingdom and throne, and all these things are related to the Davidic covenant. Now, of course, we ultimately know that was fulfilled in Christ. We know that. You can look at Luke uh, in the early chapters, and it does talk about that because there's a parallel here with that. So God promised David that one would sit on his throne. How long? Forever. forever. How long is forever? Forever. forever. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a, you know, just a few years, you know, a few decades, or even a few millennia. It's forever. The text, among others, is central to the Jewish understanding of what the kingdom actually is. The prophets talk about it. Others talk about it. Uh, there's other references outside of the New Testament and even the Old Testament, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight, but we'll cover more next time. Because in Jewish thought, the Messiah was going to be a warrior king, like David. David was a warrior and he was a king. He became the, the ideal king of Israel and one that all the other kings look back to. Remember, if you look in the Old Testament, he was not faithful like his father David was. He departed from the, the Lord unlike his father David. It was faithful just like his father David was. You can see those kinds of references there. Then after Malachi, there were no prophets. 400 years of silence. But there were things that did occur between the Old and New Testament. This is called the intertestamental period. 
So just for a second, we're going to look a little bit at the intertestamental period between the old and the new and see how just a few things did develop at that time. It is the foundation for the new. There were developments through those 400 years when it comes to the kingdom. Now again, we'll go into more details next time when we talk about perspectives of the kingdom down through history. We'll look at that, Lord willing, next week. But for some in first century Judaism, there was a messianic millennium that they believed in outside of Scripture. And we see that in the first century AD and beyond, and I want to read this to you. This is from the uh, Jewish Virtual Library, a lot of references, again, to historical books and things like that. They say this, although Jewish eschatology, study of end times, including that of the intertestamental literature, was always theocentric, that is, focused on God, concerned basically with the ultimate triumph of God and His justice, it combined this with a certain preliminary events that would precede the establishment of God's universal reign over all mankind. It's right there. On the day of the Lord. You're familiar with that if you know anything about this ministry for sure. Chief among these preliminary events would be the reign of the Messiah. And of course, you know, one Enoch and other references there. Not only from the intertestamental writings, but also from Josephus, the wars of Josephus, uh, antiquities, and the New Testament, Matthew 23, uh, 23 through 24. It is clear that the last two centuries before the destruction of the Second Temple, 70 AD, and even the succeeding generations at the time of the revolt of Bar Kokhba, uh, 132 to 135 CE slash AD, belief in the imminent coming of the Messiah was widespread in Judaism. It's important to know these things. Second, the apocalyptic writers of the intertestamental period, remember we're talking about that time frame, devised various methods for reckoning the times of the Messiah, also called Yemot HaMashiach. Other writings divided the history of the world into 12 periods of 400 years apiece. And you can see the references there. Some reckon by millennia and maintain that the reign of the Messiah itself, listen to this, this is, this is important, would last for how long? A thousand years. A thousand years. Referring to the Messianic millennium. Again, this is outside of the New Testament. A period of peace and happiness on earth before the final day of the Lord. Now, not everything is going to connect, but it's important to know the Jewish thought even outside of Scripture. And again, Lord willing, we'll talk more about that next time, because right now we're going to come to the New Testament, the New Testament. Uh, go ahead and turn or click to Matthew chapter 5. We'll get there in just a moment. Now, while you're turning there, just going to go over a few foundational things here. One Greek word for kingdom is basilea, and you can maybe hear the word basilica in there. You can hear that there. This word is used over 160 times in the New Testament. Used in different ways, different contexts. For example, uh, Mark 6, 23, where Herod promised half of his kingdom to Herodias' daughter because she danced and did some other stuff. <laughs> we won't go into that. There's also a reference, of course, to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Now, there are kingdom references throughout the New Testament, but there is a big concentration of them in the Gospels. A lot of them in the Gospels, uh, mainly Matthew and Luke, and we'll get to that here in just a second. But you look at the rest of the New Testament, it's very interesting. Acts has eight references. Revelation has six. First Corinthians has five. They have a very messed up church, so they had to have a few, I guess. Hebrews has three. And the letters of Paul, Peter, and James, they have only one or two. It's very interesting when you actually start thinking about how many references there are or are not in the New Testament about this topic. So there's that. So let's look first now at the Gospel and Acts. Gospels and Acts. The Kingdom in the Gospels and Acts. In the Gospels, Jesus talked about the Kingdom a lot. Primarily recorded in the, in the Gospels of uh, Matthew and Luke. And there are some even say it's the central theme of His teaching, which was the Kingdom, with an eschatological overtone. What does eschatological mean? Who, who knows that? End times, end times, end times. Now, Matthew uses kingdom over 50 times. It's quite a bit. Mark uses it almost 20. Luke, over 40. And John, how many? About five times. Very interesting, again. And if you know when these things were written, I think that really is important to that. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were written before 70 AD, before the temple was destroyed. 
before Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus and his army. The Gospel of John, written between 85 and 95 AD. So it was the last Gospel written also. And in John's Gospel, there's only two chapters where the word kingdom is used. Two references are in John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5. Jesus talks to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, which would make sense because he is a Pharisee, a religious leader would think about the kingdom. So he would, that's perfectly understandable. And then the other three are in one verse, John 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Now, what is the context of this verse? Talking to... When is your kingdom coming? I'll let you go back and look at that. You can look at That's your homework for tonight. <laughs> but this is the only two references, two verses, two chapters rather, where the kingdom is mentioned in the Gospel of John. Now, Matthew, this is where we're going to start. Matthew is important because he wrote to the Jews. He focused on Jesus as king. You know, we have, you know, Marv's talked a lot about you know, the Gospel of Matthew. You know, Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of David. And Matthew says Jesus is king. He is our king. He is the promised king, of course, from the Davidic line. Now, they didn't say God. They didn't say God because they were afraid they would blaspheme his holy name. So rather than using kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is used in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, there are some who will say, well, it's two separate things that takes it out of its Jewish context and it makes Jesus say two different things to the same groups of people, which doesn't make any sense. So it's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is the same thing. Because remember, he was speaking to the Jews. He's talking to the Jews at this time. And in the Gospels, there were a few Gentiles, but his primary audience was Jewish because he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. Now, Matthew 4, 17 starts everything. Now, we're going to go through a lot of scriptures. I'm going to have them up here just so you don't have to you know, turn and click and everything. And we'll get to Matthew 5 here in just a moment. From that time, that is after his temptation... After he succeeded in the wilderness, he overcame the tempter and the temptations. Jesus began to preach and say, repent for what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, is at hand. Now let's look at a couple other ones here. Matthew 4.23, Jesus was going throughout Galilee, teaching <laughs> in all their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kinds of disease and every kinds of sickness among the people. Now we have to make a pause here because we see the word gospel, we have an automatic thought that pops into our mind that we need to be very careful of. This was before Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, some 20 years plus. The word gospel just means good news. It was just a word they used for various things. And here the gospel relates to the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. And be, so again, be careful about putting things where they don't belong when it comes to interpreting Scripture. And the last few verses of this chapter talks about his fame in Syria, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, beyond the Jordan River. Now, why was he doing this? Why was, why was all this recorded? Because he was saying, this is what the kingdom will be with me as your Messiah, with me as your king. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide all your needs. I'm your king. I'm here. I am the promised one. Look to me. Trust me. Believe in me. And sadly, of course, we know what happens later. And that brings us to the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We have to remember again, he's speaking to the Jews. He's talking to the Jews in this chapter. Now, he explains the kingdom, he expounds the Ten Commandments, he corrected wrong views of the Mosaic Law, among other things, in these wonderful, wonderful chapters. In these chapters, there's about seven or eight references to the kingdom. Now, there's some present tense words, we have to be honest here, in chapter 5, 3 and 10, for example, but there's also future tense, the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That was a, a basic prayer they would pray. But look at chapter 5, and I'm just going to kind of throw this out, and you guys can do your own study on it here a little bit later. 
Chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom, kingdom of heaven. Jump down to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom, kingdom of heaven. It bookends mm -hmm. these things. That's important. I would just say that and move on and make you think about that and do your own study on that because I'm being mean and we need to move on. <laughs> the Lord's Prayer is the desire for God's kingdom to come and be established. As we saw, that was a, a basic <laughs> desire within Judaism at the time and even beyond then. And it also refers to the requirements to enter the kingdom, which is something that's important too. Now we come to Matthew 8. Now we will not go over all the references in the Gospels. We just can't do that. There's too many. Matthew 8, 11 through 12. This is really cool. Jesus marvels at the centurion's faith. A Roman guard who had authority over other individuals. A Gentile. He said, I have not seen such faith, no, in all of Israel. Because this guy just said, speak the word. My servant will be healed. Wow, that's cool. Then he says this, and, I, and said, I say to you that many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this is a future tense. You can see that. Will be. Will be. It will happen. Now there is some confusion about this. Some say that those from the East and West are Gentiles. How many of you ever heard that? How many of you, have you ever heard that? A few of you may have heard that, yeah. Well, we have to ask, what does it mean biblically? What does it mean contextually? Because there will also be individuals who use this text to say the church has replaced Israel. Some will use this text as that. It doesn't say that, by the way. It never it says that in, in any, any way, shape, or form. But we have to ask, what is going on in this text? How is this saying? And it just blows my mind. Because you can also find this in Luke 13, by the way, 28 and 29, if you want to look at some other references. Those from the East and West is exile imagery from the Old Testament. One example is Isaiah 43, verses 4 through 6. It's exile imagery. And the text does not say that the church has replaced Israel in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Just want to let you know that. You say, well, what are the sons of the kingdom? You can do your own study on that. Next one, Matthew 27, or I'm sorry, Matthew 12, 27 through 28. Jesus describes what is currently taking place in his ministry, not what will happen in the future. He's confronting and correcting an accusation. He says this, if by Beelzebul, I cast out demons by whom your sons cast them out, or by whom do your sons cast them out. For this reason they will be your judges, but if I cast the demons out by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now some translations will say in you or something like that. That's not the best translation, unfortunately. There is a contrast here between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. The rule of Satan, the rule of God, it probably has more to do with timing and power than it does anything else. And here Jesus is present doing the work, and that's important. Now, I want to say one more quick thing here. When you study this topic, be prayerful. Ask the Lord to show you your assumptions when it comes to this. Because I'm still studying this, by the way. This is not one thing you can study for a few weeks or a few months or even a few years. It takes a long time to go through this topic, a very long time, a long, long time, in fact. Now we come to Matthew 13, Matthew 13. There are many, many references to the kingdom in this chapter. This is where Jesus starts speaking to them in parables. Now let me ask you a question. Why did Jesus start talking in parables? Dangerous to say certain things, okay. Why else? Right. It was to hide the truth from some and to reveal it to others. And that's actually what Isaiah said was going to happen. You know, so when people are like, well, we got to tell stories in church and do all this, because Jesus, that is not what the parables were about. Now, a good story every now and then is fine, but 
there's a purpose for the parables to reveal truth and to hide truth. That's exactly why Jesus did this. And the disciples were given the opportunity to know the secrets of the kingdom. Verse 11, verse 19 says, those who hear about it but don't understand have what is sown taken away by the evil one. And in this chapter, pay very close attention to whom he's speaking to. Because not all of the parables were for the crowds. Some were for the disciples alone. It's a very important um, little tidbit of information when it comes to this. Very, very important. Now, then in verses 24 through 30, you have the parable of the weeds or the, the tares or the darnel, however you want to define that or describe that. And there's a few different views on this. We're just going to go over these real quick and then move on. I just want to let you know this, these are a few things that do exist. One is that it's the current time, the current age in which we live, where people are believing in Christ, coming to faith. They're the wheat. And those that reject are the weeds, the darnel, not true believers. And then when Christ comes, he will separate the two. That's one view. Another one is that after the millennium, Christ will crush the rebellion after Satan is released. That's another possible view. And then, you know, there's a combination of those views in verses 36 through 43. Kind of explain and expound on that just a little bit more. If you're exhausted now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, so take a deep breath. Here we go. We're going to keep going. Matthew 16, verse 27 through 17, 2. A little bit longer here. For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste or experience death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. After six days, Jesus took with Him Peter and James, John 2, His brother, and led them to a high mountain by themselves, and He was transfigured before them, and His face shone like the sun. Wouldn't that have been great to see that? That would have been so cool. And His clothes became white as light. Now we need to remember, there were no chapter or verse divisions in the original. That did not exist for many, many, many centuries afterwards. So the context, the kingdom is connected to this transfiguration. Now some will say, well, that was the kingdom. No, because Jesus didn't judge his enemies. He, there's a whole lot of other things that did not take place. It's a prefigurement of the kingdom of what's going to happen. Why? This is important because he just told him he's going to go away. They needed the encouragement. They needed to know that their faith in Him was not going to be vain. So they needed to see at least a little bit of who He really is in His glory. He told them about that. And Peter talks about this, by the way, too, in 2 Peter 1. Now, Matthew 21, verse 43. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. Wow. There it is, right? Taken from the Jews? <clears throat> nope, wrong answer. Some say this means God terminated his relationship with Israel because of the crucifixion. There are some who will say that. They transferred, it, transferred the kingdom to the church or spiritual Israel or something like that. No. Why? How do you know that? Well, all you got to do is look a few verses later. Verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. There's a specific group of people Jesus is talking about here. Just a couple verses later. It's amazing when we just look at the context, <laughs> what the context tells us. The kingdom was going to be taken away from these religious leaders and given to a people. You say, well, who is that people? Oh, that was a church. No. It's explained in chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Those from the streets. Regular, everyday, normal people who trust their Messiah. That's what it is. It's a contrast to these things. Those from the streets. Contrast with the religious leaders who should have known and then regular people. But the thing is, they were all Jewish. It has nothing to do with Gentiles at all. And it's, you know, it's caused a, a lot of confusion. Now, I'm not saying we rule out Gentiles completely, but the parable of this wedding banquet contextually is Jewish. We have to keep that in mind too. Now to Luke 17. Luke 17. Verses 20 and 21. 
being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. Remember, these are the religious leaders. They should know all this stuff. He answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now, this has also caused a lot of confusion, and unfortunately, the King James translates it within you. That, again, is a bad translation. I mean, the King James is fine, but that is not what the word entos means, E-N-T-O-S. It means in your midst or among you. You know, right now, I'm among you, right? And we have to remember, who is he talking to here? The Pharisees. They didn't have the kingdom of God in them. They were complete rebellion against God and, and Christ. Some were, not all of them. And it does not mean in or within you. It's among you, in your midst. And the word is, is in the present tense. So this is referring to Jesus there as the king talking to them in his ministry, in his ministry. And then in verses 22 through 37, he explains it more. And it's a reference to the end of the age when Christ returns. Again, you can look at that. It's, it's right there. Don't take my word for it. Search the scriptures. Look at what the word of God says. And he says, don't chase after the false messiahs. That's what he tells them. So with all of this said, this is why there's some confusion about the kingdom. The kingdom teaching of Jesus involved declarations about both his present ministry and the future tied to it. A kingdom long viewed as strictly future and greatly anticipated was being pulled into the present, made initially available at the exercise of redemptive power that showed that the struggle was not merely with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Jesus, when he was living on earth, walking on earth, ministering on earth as the king of the Jews, I'm here. I'm your king. Trust me. I'll provide for you. Put your faith in me. Some did, but of course the religious leaders were against him. And then what did they have? What did they do? Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Now, maybe he focused on this eschatological kingdom and his return and reiterated that God is king over all, thi all things. That's possible because the Old Testament does say that. But Jesus used both present and future imagery about the kingdom. And that's where, again, some of the confusion comes in. Some say that he used present tense because he was there. And I think that's possible. But also, too, he used the present tense to talk about himself as the king, but also saying, I'm going to be coming again to establish this kingdom. So you guys got to be ready. And the only way to be ready is for, to believe in me and trust me. And again, that's where the debate lies. So that's just a very basic overview of some references in Matthew. Now we're going to go to the, the book of Acts. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Now we must remember, must remember, <laughs> Jesus is resurrected. He's been with them for how long? 40 days. 40 days. What has he been doing for 40 days? Teaching them about what? The kingdom. That's what, that's, look at the look. Look at Acts chapter 1. Again, don't take my word for it. Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 3. Again, he's, he's risen, uh, presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that brings us to verses 4 through 6. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, what you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time restoring or going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And if, as far as I can tell, they, it's a continuation. They continue. Are you going to do it now? You're going to do it now? It's like when a kid goes, Mom, 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 Mom. Are you going to do it? Are you going to restore the kingdom to us now? Is it going to happen now? You've died. You've resurrected. You're, you're here. Is it time? And what does Jesus do? Why did you ask me that? I can't believe you're so stupid. Did you say that? No, he did not. We have to remember. <laughs> He had taught the kingdom 40 days to them prior to the situation. They were not stupid. They were not morons. They knew something was going on. They didn't fully understand, but they were ready and they wanted it to happen. And he just says, 
It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his, in his hands. But you, then he gives them instructions about what to do next. So it's important to think about these things as you read them. So these are just a couple of examples there, by the way. And there's a few more in the uh, book of Acts where the word kingdom is used. You can see the references there. I've got one up here because I think it's really important. This is after Paul was stoned to death. He gets back up, goes back in the city, and he continues preaching. I mean, what a guy. I mean, what a, what a testimony. Then the next day, he and Barnabas go to Derby, And then this happens. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now this is one reference again. You can look at the other ones again in your own time. I've given those to you here. But it doesn't give a time frame or anything. It just says this is, this is what's going to happen. Difficulty. Difficulty. Problems. Uh, pain. Sorrows. Tribulation. Thlipsis. Pressure. And we also have to remember one thing. Pay a close attention to this. When the book of Acts was taking place, ministry, Paul's ministry was going on. The book of Acts covers about 30 A.D. to about 62 A.D., so over 30 years in that book. You have Paul's missionary journeys, you know, first three of them. He was released after that in 28 and went on a fourth one. So all these things were actually taking place during Paul's ministry. To put the New Testament together because that really will help unfold some of those things. And we find that the kingdom is not really a primary focus for Paul. He did talk about it. Um, he referred to it like in Acts 20:25, 20, when meeting with the Ephesian elders, who were Jewish, by the way. Uh, he said he proclaimed the kingdom, and that's, he, that's all he says. He just makes that statement. We're not told in what way or how or what the details are. But now we're going to look at the rest of the New Testament. Now for this, mostly we're just going to read some of the references. I won't give a lot of detail or explanation except for a few. And then, kind of, Lord willing, put all this together at the end. So you still with me? If you're awake, yawn. Okay, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> So the kingdom in the rest of the New Testament. So we looked a little bit at the Gospels, a little bit at the book of Acts. Now we'll look at the rest of the New Testament. One thing to keep in mind, as you're reading these things, look at the time references in the verses. Very, very important. Time references. So here we go. Romans 14, 16 through 17. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It is present tense. 1 Corinthians 4, 19 and 20. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out <laughs> not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Again, there's really nothing that explains what Paul's talking about here. But then we come to some other ones. 1 Corinthians 6. Verses 9 and 10. Or do you not know that un, the unrighteous will not, what's the next few words? Inherit. Inherit the kingdom of God. That's a future tense. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of denominations and churches need to really study these verses here because they've compromised them over and over and over again. But here we have two references in a couple of verses to the future kingdom of God, right there in the text. Again in 1 Corinthians, starting in verse chapter 15, rather, where he says this, 22 to 25, For as in Adam all die. And by the way, what is the, the focus of 1 Corinthians 15? What's the main idea? Resurrection. 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 Does the resurrection happen now? No, future. No, future. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. There's a resurrection. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. He was first. Then at his coming, second coming of Christ, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. So we're having a sectional thing going on here. When he does what? He delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all, thing, all enemies under his feet. Now, there's a few possible views here. One, again, it refers to today. Or when Christ comes, he is going to give the kingdom to the Father. 
uh, doesn't really fit. Refers to the end of millennium, when all of his enemies will be destroyed. I'll let you chew on both of those there. When he stops Satan's coup attempt after the millennium trying to, to take over. Then another one in chapter 15, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Again, a future tense, nor does perishable inherit the imperishable. Then we come to Galatians, one of Paul's earlier letters, chapter 5, 19 to 21. I'm trying to give you a little bit of the context too, by the way, not just the one verse that has a kingdom in it. Now the works of the flesh are evident, and here he has this litany and list. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, <sighs> fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and just in case there's something I didn't mention, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who, what, do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, a future tense, a future time. Then we have Ephesians 5.5. 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, what's that say? Has, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, again, when you think of Jewish thought, and even the world today, when do you get your inheritance? After someone dies. After someone dies. Which again will be a future time. So that's Ephesians 5.5. 5. Now Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Here's a present tense. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we do have a present tense here. Then we come to Colossians 4.11b. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they've been a comfort to me. Again, there's no qualification or details about what Paul means here, so we, we have to be kind of careful about what we're saying. Then 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and I promise you'll be out by midnight, by the way. Just want to let you know that. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a way or a manner worthy of God, who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. Into, again, that's the present tense there. Second Thessalonians, chapter 1, 5, and 6. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom for which you are also suffering. Now, again, we're not really defined what the kingdom is by these passages. It's just talking to you, know, since indeed God considers you, considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. So in other words, in the future, God's going to repay them. So be, take good heart, be of good faith. 2 Timothy 4.1. Another one, very important reference. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Wow. Imagine the Apostle Paul saying that to you. I charge you. I solemnly charge you. Who is to judge the living and the dead? What? and by His appearing and His kingdom. Future reference at the return of Christ. 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter, his swan song, so to speak. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into His heavenly kingdom. That's an interesting thought. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 Quotes from Psalm 45, 6, and 7, so I won't talk about that. But now we're going to go to Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Now, real quick, to whom was the book of Hebrews written? Hebrews. Hebrews. It says it in the name. Jewish followers of Christ who were tempted to fall back under the sacrificial system because of persecution. And this book is uh, basically a set of sermons put together. It's a very good book, but it can be a very complex book if you don't think Jewish. And the writer says this, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Ooh, wow. That's a powerful verse there. James 2.5, also one of the earlier letters written. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? And what heirs of the kingdom? Again, future which He has promised to those who love Him. Again, that same thing in the Old Testament. Same idea, same concept. Now we're going to get to 2 Peter, 
who was there at the Transfiguration, chapter 1, 10, 11. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. His primary audience was Jewish, by the way, in both letters. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there, what is that? Will be. Will be. What tense is that? Future. Future. Richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hmm. Now we come to the book of Revelation. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. Again, there's no definition of what that means there. Priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now some other references. Revelation 1.9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom. So he's in prison on Patmos. I'm your partner in the kingdom. And the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on the account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Then he says this. They sang a new song. Worthy are you. And you heard, heard about this fairly recently. <laughs> Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain. Who is this talking about? Jesus. Jesus. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That in, that in itself is a wonderful thing. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. 1115. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has what? Become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. At that time, it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. Then chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ come. have come. Has it happened yet? No. no. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. Now, this is in the Daniel 70th week. It's not the end of it. It's not the end of it. Then 1915. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. One thing to keep in mind, and you may remember this, when a king established his kingdom, he had to fight for it. What do you think Jesus is doing at his second coming? He's coming to fight to establish his kingdom. That's part of what the book of Revelation is about. About Christ, about who he is, about coming and saying, okay, time's up. <laughs> Your time's done. Bam. It's part of what the day of the Lord is. It's part of what the day of the Lord is. Now, this doesn't say kingdom, but it does refer to the future rule of Christ. And that's why I included it in here. Now, a few concluding thoughts. I'm sure your head is spinning. You've heard so many different scripture references. You're like, I'd have no idea how to put all this together. Well, I hope to do a little bit of that here in just the next few minutes. One important factor to remember when studying this and anything that in the Jewish mind, within the context of salvation, it was not exclusively focused on the forgiveness of sin. Though it was included, it, quote, this is an important uh, thing here that I, I got from the uh, um, Israel Bible Center. It had to do with God's uncontested rule on earth in the same way His rule was already manifested in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The eternal reign of righteous King Jesus over both Israel and the nations was the salvation the prophets of Israel spoke of and which the nations earnestly desired. So we see it's, it's more than just salvation. It's a whole big historical event that's going to take place. And that's, I think, important to know. And also, too, as we read, Paul links those with those who live in sin will not inherit the kingdom. They won't. Future tense. But also recall that heaven is where God's rule is. And, and this is something that really kind of opened my eyes a little bit more. And of course, those who don't put their faith in Christ won't go to heaven. And it makes perfect sense. But Paul also linked the kingdom to heaven in some references. While at other times he refers to the second coming of Christ. Why? Why did he do that? Jesus did the same thing on the Sermon on the Mount. You know, read it. Read Matthew 5-7. through 7. He does the same thing. 
And other times Paul mentions kingdom without a time reference at all, as we saw that too. It just depends on the context. Keep the context of those verses. Now for the rest of the New Testament, again, the focus on, on uh, the kingdom wasn't there much. You say, why? In the Gospels, Jesus was present on earth. That's why there's so many references. He said, this is what the kingdom will be. That is one thing that was very different in the Gospels, by the way. In Revelation, there is references not only about Christ starting to rule his kingdom, but the kingdoms of the earth becoming the kingdom, kingdoms of his. And the kingdoms of the earth are not spiritual kingdoms. They're literal physical kingdoms that, that are, will be there at that time. But we do have to be honest. While some present tense words and verbs are used, the primary focus is still a future physical kingdom that God promised to Israel where Jesus will rule, where he will reign, and he will fulfill all the promises that God made to the Jewish people. The inheritance is mentioned. We saw it. We talked about it. It will happen in the future. And even though there are the present tense uses, it's, the kingdom is never said to be totally present on the earth. You don't find that in those references at all. Now, your view is going to depend upon a variety of factors, which we won't get into. And Lord willing, next week, we will study kingdom perspectives down through history. We will see how there was a transition from this idea of a literal, physical, millennial kingdom ruling reign of Christ to this kind of ethereal, weird spiritualization of all the stuff that we've been talking about. So I hope this was helpful to you. I hope it challenges you to think about what the text says, looking at the context, the time frame, the references. And again, don't just take one or two verses, look at the whole context, particularly when it comes to the Gospels and to whom the kingdom was going to be taken from and given to. Very, very important to look at the context. So Lord willing, next time, We'll see those changes. We'll see those changes. And I only kept you a few minutes over. I tried to get done on time, and I told you we'd be out before midnight, and we are. So uh, if you have any questions, we can talk about that afterwards. Let's go ahead and pray, because I know a few of you may have to head out. Gracious Lord, our God, we do thank you for who you are. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. And Lord, whatever our view of the kingdom is, may we be challenged to look at your word. May we be encouraged to think about who you are and that yes you do rule and reign over the affairs of men and earth and only by faith in you can we submit to your rulership in our own lives but Lord we cannot deny that there is still the future kingdom coming in whatever way we define it your word is clear you will fulfill your promises to Israel and Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem and we look forward to that and it's in His name, for Your glory, and His name's sake we pray. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire Magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire Magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.